Welcome back, folks, to another exciting JLamp Bio video. Today, I am here to talk to you about solutions, solubility, and energy of solutions. So we're going to talk a little bit about how different solutions are made. We're also going to focus on the energies behind how solutions are formed and talk a little bit about the concept known as entropy. Again, another exciting video today. Uh, this one is brought to you by Sprite. Refreshing taste, and that lemon-lime flavor, you've got to love Sprite. Let's move on to some vocab. Before we move on to vocab, let's talk about our student learning objectives. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to explain solutions. Not to a problem, silly. <laughs> That's a knee slapper. You should be able to determine the solubility of a compound using the solubility chart, and then also evaluate how the energy of solutions determines if a solute will dissolve. So we have quite a few vocabulary terms today. We are going to focus on solution, solute, solvent, solubility, aqueous solution, and then maybe some new terms that you haven't heard before. Solvent cage, ion dipole forces, hydration energy, solute separation step, solvent separation step, solvation step, and entropy. So let's start off by just kind of reviewing the concept of solutions. Now, solutions themselves are homogeneous mixtures of two or more substances. And you know homogeneous mixtures are uniform throughout. The solute is the substance that is being dissolved in the solvent, which is the liquid or other material that the solute dissolves in. The resulting material is a solution. Do keep in mind that like dissolves like, and what I mean by that is that polar substances will dissolve things that are polar, and nonpolar substances will dissolve things that are nonpolar. Now, solutions do not just have to be liquid. They can be things like metal alloys, like brass. Air is another example of a solution. It just has to be a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. It can be a solid liquid or gas. Solutions where water is the solvent are known as aqueous solutions, which makes sense because aqua means water. So when we talk about the concept of solubility, solubility is just simply the ability to dissolve in solution. Some materials will not dissolve in solution due to polarity and other factors. If you think about oil and water will not mix. Oil and water are insoluble. Um, if we look at ionic compounds, some are soluble and some are not soluble. In that case, we would use the solubility chart to determine if the material will dissolve in solution. Uh, you got a solubility chart last year. It was a very simple tool that let you know if something stays solid or something goes to uh, aqueous when it is put into solution. So diving in a little bit deeper than what we did last year, what determines the concept of solubility? Like what determines whether something will dissolve or not? And we need to keep in mind that when we do dissolve something, three things happen simultaneously. The solute dissolves, the solvent has to separate, and then the solvent and the solute have to essentially mix together. So we'll take these one step at a time, and what I want you to think about as we go through this is the energy that is present behind all of these different reactions. So the first step is the solute dissolving step. So in order for a solution to occur, the solute has to break apart of the solute into its individual ions. Now, if you think about it, you are breaking apart chemical bonds. When you break chemical bonds, you have to put energy into the system. Okay, So breaking of bonds is an endothermic process. The making of bonds is an exothermic process. Now, that seems a little bit like the opposite of what you may have been taught previously, but you have to think that you have to put energy into something in order to break the bonds that are present. So the first step is we're breaking that solute, we're breaking that salt that we're dissolving into its individual ions. As a result, that requires energy. The next step is the solvent separation step, which is where solvent particles push away from each other to make room for the solute particles. The solvent has to expand in order to make room for the solute. Now, if this is water, this requires an input of energy to overcome the hydrogen bonding that's present between the water molecules. That has to break and separate in order for the solute to be able to fit in between the solvent molecules. Again, this requires an input of energy, so this is also an endothermic process, meaning that energy is absorbed into um, the system in order to break the bonds. The last step is solvation. It sounds like you're solving a problem, but you're not. Well, you kind of are, but... I digress. Solvation is where the ions disperse into the holes that are created. Those holes are called solvent cages. So when the solvent separates, there's little holes that are in the solvent. That's where the solute particles are able to go in. These charged ions form ion dipole forces, which release energy. Remember, we just talked about when we make bonds, we release that energy. And so as a result, that is an exothermic process. 
So we need to kind of keep all three of these things in mind in order to determine if a particular solute is going to dissolve when it is put into solution or if it won't. Now again, taking a look at the ion dipole forces, make sure you are aware that positively charged ions are going to be attracted to the negatively charged oxygen molecules and vice versa. Negatively charged ions will be attracted to the positively charged uh, hydrogens on the water molecule, forming ion dipole bonds. So we need to really think about the energy change that is present within the system. Since we break bonds in the first two steps, the energy value is positive. When breaking bonds, the material takes in energy, so the energy goes up. You'll notice that on the chart it says enthalpy. We'll talk a little bit more about how energy and enthalpy are related in a later unit. The last step of, in the last step, in the last step, the energy value is negative as bonds are being made, thus energy is being released back into the system. I'm sorry, back into the surroundings. If we add up all the energy values and E is negative, the substance will dissolve, meaning that it's releasing energy. If this E is positive, then odds are it will not dissolve. So that's how we determine if a particular solute is going to dissolve in a given solvent. We have to look at the uh, change in energy values for the three steps that were mentioned previously. Let's do a practice problem with this. For a given solute in water, the energy changes are delta E of the solute separation is 835, delta E of the solvent separation is 98 kilojoules, and the delta E of solvation is negative 805 kilojoules. Will this solute dissolve in water? So the first thing I want you to notice is that solute separation and solvent separation are all positive values, where solvation is a negative value. So that kind of helps you understand that the first two steps take in energy, therefore they are endothermic, and the last step releases energy, which makes it exothermic. So all we need to do is get the delta E of the total solution. And in order to do that, we just add all three of these together. It's really simple. So we're going to take 835, adding 98, adding negative 805. We don't change any signs with this. When we plug that into our calculator and solve, we get that the total energy of the system is a positive 128 kilojoules. Because it is positive at the end, odds are this will not dissolve. So that's all you really have to do there, but keep in mind, you kind of draw out this energy diagram here. The energy for that first step would be here, second step here, and when we look at that last step, it's only going down this much. So if we look at it, the total energy that's produced from this is going to be positive. Okay. So again, just looking at it from a graph perspective, I think also helps as well to see that you uh, to see the change in energy and whether it is positive or negative. And again, that determines whether the solute will dissolve or will not dissolve. So the last couple things I actually want to talk about are about um, the concept of entropy. Now, all processes in the universe are essentially one of two processes. They either lower the energy or they increase the energy. So think about which is more favorable or more likely to happen spontaneously. Is something more likely to spontaneously just randomly gain energy into the system or lose it? And if you really think about concepts of you know, laws of conservation of energy, you realize that the odds are you're more likely to lose energy in a spontaneous reaction than you are to gain energy. Entropy, the concept of entropy, simply refers to the degree of order in a system. The more entropy there is, the more disorder is present. So if we take a look on the right here, there's very high entropy in that particular room. Reason being is that there is a lot more disorder in the system. If the room were clean, it would have very low entropy. So keep in mind that Entropy, with entropy, anytime a solute dissolves in solution, it always increases the entropy. There's more disorder in the solution. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you see the solid solute and the liquid solvent. They're relatively organized, not very random, but as you dissolve things in solution, you notice the randomness. You notice there's a lot more random nature of the solution than there are of the solid and the liquid. So when you think of entropy, do think a little bit about randomness and think about disorder and how that might apply to making solutions. The last thing I want to focus on are factors that impact solubility. 
and there are a variety of factors that impact the rate. These things include things like temperature. The higher the temperature, the more quickly something will dissolve. Pressure. You apply pressure to something, the more likely it will dissolve. Increasing the surface area. Think crushed ice versus ice cubes. Crushed ice keeps your drink colder because there's more surface area of the ice, and therefore it makes the liquid cooler faster. And agitation. Something simply like stirring up a solution. So keep all these things in mind, and particularly all the new energy stuff that we have talked about, as well as the concepts of entropy. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, and make sure you shop merch. Have a great day, guys, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.